We had a little baby boy who was alive for about an hour. You live the double life. <laughs> Not many people get to experience that in life. So we got married in Melbourne. Flew to Sydney, he did the voice audition, he got through, all four judges turned around. I needed to have a baby. For me, medicine just seemed like the natural career. We never ever thought that we would have trouble getting pregnant or having a family. It's just one of those things that you never think will happen to you. But what keeps you going? What makes you want to continue to be the doctor? My patients inspire me a lot more than I would inspire them. I've always been amazed by the achievements of immigrants. I've used that to inspire my own transformation from migrant to student to social worker to artist and now to TV presenter and producer. Foreign Influence tells the stories of people like me and so many other people who have gone on the incredible journeys of achievement. I am so proud to celebrate five years on Channel 31 and looking forward to many more bringing you inspirational stories to your screen. Elena Reddy, Foreign Influence. to foreign influence. This episode is the perfect example what it means to sacrifice everything in order for the better future of your children. Leave your country, leave everything you know behind and go to somewhere completely unknown. And what happens? Nelu, welcome to Foreign Influence. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to talk about your family. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Please tell us about your parents and their incredible journey before we get to your extraordinary <laughs> journey. Sure, so my parents were brought up and grew up in Sri Lanka and all our ancestors are from Sri Lanka. And they moved here when I was just two years old, when my mum was pregnant with my sister. Wow, pregnant lady going to another country. Yeah, so they decided to pack up everything and move. There was a lot of civil unrest at the time in Sri Lanka and there was a lot going on in the country. Um, but for them, I think it was really about giving us a better life, as you will, and a good education and giving us more opportunities. So uh, I think they made the difficult decision to leave everything behind, leave the whole family behind and bring us here and start a new life here and couldn't be more grateful. What do you remember, like your earliest memories? What was it like? Was it a big community that uh, your parents were part of once they came to Australia? Yeah, look, I don't have many memories of my time in Sri Lanka, but I have many fond stories about it. So I know that my grandparents were around a lot. Um, as you probably know, overseas, a lot of family are involved in raising children. It really is a village. Yes. When we moved here, there was a small com Sri Lankan community here and it definitely grew in the time we were here. I think for my parents it was quite difficult to be away from their family and their supports and their support network. Um, but we very quickly sort and of found out. How about the language? What was the language? Did they have a huge language barrier or could they speak English? They could yeah. speak English. So they had learnt English at school and at university. Uh, obviously there was a language barrier, but I think it was actually more of a cultural bar barrier. Understanding the way the culture works and how it's different and even just simple things like road rules and Medicare and all of that sort of stuff and getting yourself set up in a whole new country. And your parents, they were extremely well educated. They both did engineering and I, th I think that's where they met and then came here and able, were able to translate their skills here as well. Um, Incredible. But, you know, they, they didn't come from wealthy families and it, it wasn't a handed to them on a silver platter. They worked pretty hard to get to where they were, which is probably translated down to me and my sisters because we're all pretty hard working. <laughs> Did you follow a lot of cultural traditions growing up? 
Yeah, I think it was really important for them that we still remembered where we came from. I very much identify as an Australian now because I pretty much grew up here, but we know that our heritage and our home is Sri Lanka, so I think it was really important to them that that was brought into us. So all of us have Sri Lankan names. We went to Sri Lankan schools. We learned how to speak and write in Sinhalese. And then they got us involved in other things. So we used to do a lot of Sri Lankan dance. So, you know, I went through all the different sort of um, tutorials and classes, learnt all the various types of Sri Lankan dance and my sisters and I used to perform everywhere in Victoria <laughs> when we were younger at That's weddings incredible. and events and it was a really nice way to keep the culture in us. My parents took us back to Sri Lanka a lot as well so we did travel quite a bit when we were younger and made sure we spent time meeting the family and trying to see our cousins and because we didn't miss out on that being here. We didn't really have that yeah. close family connection and that wider family. Well, that's part of the immigration that you really become separated, but that's yeah. wonderful you had that opportunity yeah. to go back. Yeah. Yes, very, very grateful for the times that we went back and I, I look forward to taking my children back as well soon. While you were a child of immigrants, you had a dream growing up. Partly my parents sort of bringing us here, giving us a really good education and striving towards a professional career that would be sort of well respected and give back to the community was part of it. So they were really keen for us to, to get into medicine and for me I think I've always loved people, problem solving, science and so for me medicine just seemed like the natural career that brought that all together. It was meant to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and then you know I was, I was lucky enough that I, I worked really hard and got into medical school at the end of Year 12. Which medical school did you go to? I went to the University of Melbourne. So my university! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I've completed my med school there and I did the extra year in research um, where I actually went to Sri Lanka and I spent a lot of my time in Sri Lanka um, and researched international health and how the midwife system works in Sri Lanka and I actually did some placements there for a couple of months and then I ended up getting the, the um, honours for the research project so I think it was I think it was um, it was appreciated that we had sort of gone overseas and see what see what happens in third world countries and and although Sri Lanka is socioeconomically very different to Australia they do a, a lot of things really well there in the health system so it was really nice to learn learn from them and just beautiful people and beautiful culture but it was definitely an eye-opener because we're very lucky here. Being a medical student, I imagine there are so many challenges. Through those challenges, you probably learn so much about yourself. What was the most challenging for you? Um, I think the most challenging for me is dealing with like the really sad situations. And I still struggle with that. I've been, I went through six years of medical school, 12 years of paediatric training, now I'm a paediatrician. And I still cry when I speak to families, you know, I think it's just, I think it's really hard to know that, to have that sort of compassion and know what people are going through. I find it really challenging in paediatrics, particularly now that I've had children, really, really hard to give bad news to families. So it's definitely the one thing that I struggle with the most. More than the hours and the exhaustion and the stress, it's just um, giving a family that news that something is seriously wrong with their child is probably one of the worst things I have to do in my job. But what keeps you going? What makes you want to continue to be the doctor? Oh, there's so many things. And I think in paediatrics, it's the smiles. It's the, you know, we do deliver bad news, but 99% of the time it's good news and kids get better and kids are amazing. They just bounce back and they're so resilient. And, you know, I've got a, a patient at the moment who's waiting for a liver transplant. She's not even two and she's just always smiling. Every time I see her, she's got the biggest smile on her face and she's sitting there while her liver is failing and she's waiting for a new liver and she's still just got a smile on her face. Yeah, finds a way to yeah, find joy just, in life. It is incredible. We can learn so much from children and I just love it. My patients inspire me a lot more than I would inspire them. Well, we wish your patient all the very best. Oh, thank yeah. you. Tell us about the love of your life <laughs> <laughs> because that's an incredible story in itself. Yes, the love of my life. When we moved here, um, his family actually supported us settling in and in our immigration process. Just to remind process. people, when you moved here you were two and you already met the love of your yes. life. Yes, <laughs> yes, I met the love so of my life. So people start early. <laughs>
<laughs> At that stage, I clearly did not know that he was going to be the love of my life. But yes, we met when we were infants and his auntie used to babysit us and we used to fight and we've got photos of us being really cheeky. So you already started learning conflict resolution. Yep. <laughs> We're still learning that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sort of drifted apart a bit as our family moved to the other side of town and then they got busy and we got busy and then we reconnected as older, you know, teenagers and we fell in love, if you will, and uh, uh, became sort of high school sweethearts and ended up getting married. Tell us about his passion and his profession. He did industrial design and audio engineering, so he's got a lot of artistic, creative passions. He fell into the family business with my dad, which was, which was really good for him. So he was sort of helping my dad with the garage door business and um, doing a lot of the management side of that. And so then two engineers together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but his real side passion had been singing and music. And he was very shy and it took him a very long time to open up. But eventually, before we got married, he auditioned for The Voice and got through quite, there's about 10 rounds before you get onto yes, the TV round. Yes. The Voice Australia. The Voice Australia, yes. He auditioned for all those rounds and then he found out that he got onto the TV round. Uh, unfortunately, the audition was two days after our wedding. <laughs> so, so we got married in Melbourne, flew to Sydney, he did the Voice audition, he got through, all four judges turned around. Um, and he picked, he picked Will I Am as his coach. And then we literally jumped, jumped on a plane and went to Sri Lanka to have our wedding in Sri Lanka the next weekend. So it was wow. a, a crazy week with two weddings and a blind audition, but it was amazing. A lot of adrenaline, so I can imagine. Adrenaline. So much adrenaline. And then we came back from our honeymoon. Did he sing at the wedding? He did. Aww. He did. He sang John Legend, All of Me, which... Um, it's one of my favorite songs. Yeah, it was amazing. I don't think there was a dry eye in the room. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then when we came back, it took a few months for it to air on TV. It just opened up all these doors. You know, he started doing all these amazing gigs. We went back to Sri Lanka a few times. He, he became really big in Sri Lanka, did some massive performances there. He did a show at the Maldives where they opened a new resort. And so wow. we, we did a Motown show with the orchestra. I quit work for two years. So you paused your medical career and you became his manager. Yes. I also had some health issues going on at the time as well. So I decided that the hours I was doing was just not good for my just health. Just needed a break. But it was a really fun time. We did, you know, we did premieres and red carpets and f free flights to um, Hamilton Islands and all sorts of things. It was, it was a really That's fun time. That's amazing. Yeah. It's like you live the double life kind of in the way. Yeah. Not many people get to experience that in life. And then after a couple of years of that, I decided I should probably should just finish my training. Um, and then we wanted to settle down and have a family. So that sort of music era came to a bit of a really nice end for the moment. Nalu, you faced a lot of challenges yourself on health perspective. You had a miscarriage very earlier on in your marriage and then you told me that you had problem conceiving yeah. and then you had your beautiful girl who is now four yeah. and then you had your twins and they were born premature. Please tell us about the challenges that you've experienced. Yeah, um, look I guess we never ever thought that we would have trouble getting pregnant or having a family. It's just one of those things that you never think will happen to you. And then once we finally decided to start trying for a family, it was actually really hard for us to get pregnant. It was unexplained, there was no particular reason. And then we had a bit of help and we fell pregnant with our first. Um, and then unfortunately at 22 weeks, I had a placental abruption, so my placenta came off. 22 more than half. Yeah, the yeah. The baby's completely full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like I, I went into labor and I had a normal vaginal I'm delivery. So and um, we had a little baby boy who was alive for about an hour because he was only 22 weeks and very small yeah. yeah I'm so sorry yeah. Yeah. Um, because he was only 22 weeks and very small uh, he was not able to be resuscitated so he survived for about an hour which was amazing and that was a really really challenging time I was back at work at that stage I'd actually just finished all of my pediatric exams it was a really busy time doing exams while I was pregnant and working I was working lots and lots of hours and so I just stopped work again. Obviously I couldn't go back to work after that. It was a really challenging time and going back to work in paediatrics was really hard 
because yes. obviously we're dealing with babies all the time and just the nature of our work is we do we see a lot of families who you know have had um, drug affected or or other things and having lots of children and I just found that really challenging as a family who struggled to conceive and then lost a baby um, with the family that can provide stable environment yeah. to the child. Yeah, yeah, so I found that really challenging. And so when I went back to work, I, I could not work anywhere that was doing deliveries. So I was mostly working at um, the main hospital that doesn't have a maternity unit because I, I just couldn't go to deliveries. It was just too stressful. Actually, for the next few years, I didn't do any deliveries. I did just outpatient clinic work. I did medical administration. And I needed to do that pr to protect my own mental health. But actually it was amazing because I ended up really enjoying what I did. That's when I did allergy with a, and then fall, fell in love with allergy. It opened and other doors. Yeah, it opened yeah. other doors that I hadn't even imagined. During that time we did IVF because we just struggled again to get pregnant and I was just, I needed to have a baby to just yeah. be able to sort of move on. So finally got pregnant. We had a very, very smooth pregnancy, but I was a total mess. It um, was the first miscarriage. Yeah, of course. 22 weeks. So it was a really challenging pregnancy after a loss, even though medically it was pristine. I didn't even have morning sickness and it was perfect, but I was really stressed. We had a elective Caesar the week after COVID happened. <laughs> so it was COVID lockdown and then I had my Caesar and we couldn't do anything for eight months. We couldn't go anywhere beyond five kilometers, but it was actually the best. It was so good. We just lived in our bubble. You enjoyed your family. We just lived in our bubble when we didn't do anything. I just cuddled my baby for eight months straight and it was the best thing ever. Mm. She's now four, is the apple of my eye. And I then- the other two do not hear. Oh, they not say that. They're all the apples of my <laughs> eye, but you know, we had, like that was just a really nice time to connect. And then we went on to IVF because we didn't know how long it would take to get pregnant again and then we ended up with twins which was unexpected because <laughs> double the trouble but twice the fun yeah <laughs> but you know with my medical background i know the complications at yeah. twins and so i was terrified and then at, at 20 weeks at the 20 week scan they realized that one of our twins stopped growing so she was three weeks behind the other twin as the pregnancy progressed she barely grew so they were really worried about her and two times a week we were doing scans Must and have been very concerning it was so stressful they mm. they prepared us for the worst basically they said wow. you know we're not sure that she will make it but hopefully the older one will the bigger one will and so it was a really stressful time i was working full time we had a um, two year old not even two year old at home <laughs> with your husband? I think it made it stronger actually because we were we were both really stressed after especially with our background what we've been through with our first. So you um, were really pillars of support for one another. Yeah we just had That's to amazing. be. We had to be and you know we had a, a child at home this time so we couldn't just be a total mess we had to yeah. keep ourselves together. I was working and I needed to work because I wanted to finish my training as well. And then at about 29 weeks, I developed preeclampsia. So the twins actually were okay, but I got preeclampsia. I was admitted into hospital. My blood pressure was going up. And then a couple of days later, I developed HELP syndrome, which is a severe complication of preeclampsia. So I had liver failure and I had an emergency cesarean overnight at one o'clock in the morning. They rushed me in because my liver tests were through the roof. Wow. My blood pressure was uncontrollable. So Your husband must have been so stressed. He was so stressed. So suddenly we had 29 week twins in ICU. I was in ICU because I was really sick. My daughter was at home. And so his mind must have been all over the place. But um, you're strong people. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> this made us strong. Mm. <laughs> and then, yeah, so the twins, my little twin was only 600 grams when she was born, which is you're tiny. tiny. And the bigger twin was 1.3 kilos, but she was much sicker. So she had a breathing tube and the ventilator and she, they had the machine was breathing for her for five days. She was much sicker, the bigger twin. Um, and then I was sick. I didn't even see them for days because I could barely move. Yeah. It was a blur. It was a very, very stressful very time. Difficult time. They were in ICU for um, nearly six weeks, I think, and then in hospital for about three and a half months in total. The, the little twin came home with a feeding tube. Mm -hmm which she had for a while at home and 
Yeah, it was a really hard year, a really, really hard year. We had our parents were amazing. Both sets of parents really supported us. Um, they looked helped a lot with our older daughter. It was a big um, transition for her as well. You know, suddenly going yeah. from being only child to having two sisters in hospital. And where there is a lot of attention around. Yeah, them. and yeah. it was still COVID time, so siblings weren't allowed in the hospitals. We would have to leave her somewhere, go and visit the twins every day. I was pumping milk for twins and I don't know how we got through it, but we did. Well, what a stressful situation it was, but what a beautiful story in the end. Yeah, yeah, they're two now, they're very cheeky. They fight and hug and what are their personalities like? like? Because they're twins, are they similar or are they totally different? No, they are completely different. They're chalk and cheese. They're a love-hate relationship. <laughs> they're either bashing each other or they're cuddling. That's okay. They're cheeky. They're just the best. And the three of them together are just such a nice little unit. Even though the twins are twins, because one is so small and one is quite yeah. a lot bigger, it feels like they're three different ages. Yeah. And so I, they don't feel too clicky, which I think is nice for our oldest. Kind of yeah. feels like youngest, middle, oldest, and they're just they're just a nice little group of three. It's not two and one. How would you describe yourself as a mum who is a doctor? <laughs> Do you make them practice hygiene? skills all the time or you're laid back and you go oh you do need some bacteria on your hands i'm probably more of the latter if you've got a doctor parent you either go one of two ways you're either really stressed about everything because you know all the nasty things or you're really laid back and you have to be really really sick before you worry <laughs> i probably fall somewhere in between in terms of hygiene yeah we're pretty we're pretty relaxed and i guess it's just setting a good example. So we try our best to set a good example, but also kids are going to be kids. So being a mom uh, of a four-year-old <coughs> and two two-year-olds, yes. <laughs> tell us about the two-year-old tantrums yes. and what's the best way to deal with them? <laughs> Although I am medically trained in being a paediatrician, no one gives you training to be a parent. So I'm still learning uh, and I'm the first to uh, accept that I, I don't have all the answers. But from my reading, my practice, what I see at work, what I do at home, I think for me the biggest thing is um, acknowledging the feelings. So I think it's just knowing that at that age they're developing, they don't know how to regulate their emotions. And it's actually really developmentally normal for them to just lose control and not know how to bring it in. And what you do over the next few years is teaching them how to regulate those emotions. So the worst thing we can do in a tantrum is that we escalate. So I try really hard to be the calm in their storm. And you know, the children who are often told, oh, it's okay, don't worry, you'll be right, which is a very old school way of thinking. And that's just because what everyone thought was the best way to approach this. But really what that does is it diminishes the child's feelings and then they just feel unheard and they dampen it down and the next time they dampen it down and then as adults they become people who don't know how to express their emotions and it can actually end up leading to anxiety and depression because they don't know how to connect with their own emotions. So I think it's really important from day dot to understand why they're feeling that way, acknowledge it and you just sit there with them. So that's okay, I'm right here when you're ready and then when they're ready they'll just come and cuddle and sob and two minutes later they're up playing something else. Nelu. Another thing that I find so fascinating about you yeah. is that you are a woman of many talents and one of them is that you have your own TV show. Oh. <laughs> Tell us about that. I've done um, two TV shows now. One is Kids Health with Dr. Nalu, which is just paediatrics only, so just about children's health. It's mostly sort of interviewing different health professionals about various subjects. So we talked about food and allergens and food introductions, fever, viruses, mental health in children. Parts of it is me chatting with my own expertise but also chatting to other health professionals and parents as well. That was a really fun show and then I did a, a show last year which was still about health, it's called A Healthy State, um, but it wasn't just paediatrics. We only had one paediatric episode and all the rest was about different health aspects. So men's health, women's health, rural medicine, uh, there's so much um, refugee, immigrant health, mm -hmm. so different episodes and it was all featuring doctors of colour or of different ethnic backgrounds, which I thought was really great. Yeah. And I learnt a lot because I haven't done adult medicine for a very long time. Dr Nalu, 
perspective. How do you see yourself in five years? I am not one of those people that have five year, 10 year plans. I think as someone who has been through so much where plans have been shattered at the drop of a hat, I think I just realised that you can't plan too much. So for me, my plan is I'm happy, my kids are happy, that we're all safe and healthy. That's, Very that's wise. all I can ask for. Very wise, Dr. Moore. And however that looks, we'll just figure it out. <laughs>